live. Namaste. Good evening. Okay. Welcome to the day nine of the My Bharat lecture series organized by Disha Bharat. Know Your Culture is a central tenet on which Disha Bharat was built. Since 2015, Disha Bharat has been spreading Indian cultural values among the youth through its workshops and internships. The moment we say culture, we think of temples or devalaya as the shining beacon, as the holistic representation of Indian culture. For us Bharatiyas, temple isn't a mere place of worship. It stands as a symbol of our uninterrupted tradition, our national pride and much more. Today we have with us none other than Srimati Shefali Vaidya to talk to us about the role of temples and traditions in national integrity. Srimati Shefali Vaidya is an award-winning multilingual author and a media professional. She has diverse interests in the field of history of Indian textiles, temple architecture, the history of Goa and contemporary politics. She holds a postgraduate degree in communication studies and postgraduate diplomas in Indology and Spanish. Srimati Shefali Vaidya has over 20 years of work experience in the field of media, film and TV production. Currently, she is the chief curator of the Western Ghats Literature Festival Coimbatore and the Godavari Dialogues Nasik. Uh, Shefali has written many columns on temple architecture and textiles, both in English and Marathi for various leading publications. She has been an expert member of the Committee of Textiles appointed by the Central Ministry of Textiles. Shefali Vaidya is a best-selling author of three books in Marathi. All about a temple, Srimati Vaidya's first book in English is a translation of her guru, Dr. D. G. B. Deglurkar's Marathi original bestseller, Mandir Kase Pahave. She is a fellow of Ananta Leadership Academy and the recipient of the prestigious Infosys Fellowship for, from Bandarkar Oriental Research Institute, Pune. She also supports a Vedic Gurukula in Varanasi. Her keen interest in India's rich heritage and culture has made her travel extensively across India, exploring India's temples, arts, and crafts. It's my privilege to welcome Srimati Shefali Vaidya to our Disha Bharat platform. Ma'am, we are waiting to listen to you on this very important topic of the role of temple and traditions in national integrity. The stage is yours. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to come on Disha Bharati and talk about this subject, which I'm really passionate about. Uh, I'm sure that all of us have visited or had darshan at the temple at least once in our lives. Even if we call ourselves atheists now or, or, or we say that we don't believe in rituals. But even so, I am 100% sure that all of us have visited one temple or more than one temple in our lifetime. But what do we do these days when we go to a temple? We are always in a hurry, first of all. So we just go, we uh, enter the temple, we hardly ever see the temple building from the outside. We do not appreciate the architecture. We just get in straight, we remove our chapels, we go through, walk through the Sabha Mandapa at a lightning pace. We stand in front of the Garbhagraha, we do Namaskar to the deity, we take Darshan, we take the Prasad that's given by the Pujari and we uh, sit there for some time as it is mandated. But that sitting there is not, it is supposed to be a very deeply spiritual experience where you sit and you imbibe the experience of Darshan, where you introspect, where you think about why you are there in the temple. Instead of that, we just sit there for a split second uh, because our elders tell us to and we get up and then we go to our daily jobs. And that is what temples have become to us something in our busy day just to go and have a darshan of the deity. But that is not what a Hindu temple was supposed to be. A Hindu temple was supposed to be the nucleus of the social, economic, as well as the cultural life of the community in which the temple is based. Even today, if you go to any village anywhere in India, you will find that in the central point of that 
village, there will be a temple. It may be a small temple. It may be a big temple. It may just be a small uh, little, uh, you know, uh, gumti under a people tree or a banyan tree. But there'll be something that is worshipped by the people of the village. And that temple is still today the focal point of community life if you go to an Indian village. So all the elders will come there in the evening to sit and chat. All the youngsters will come there during the daytime to play. All the women will come and socialize there or celebrate their festivals. Marriages will be held there. Politics will be discussed there. Major decisions of the Grama Sabhas is usually taken in the temples. And obviously, all the festivals that are associated with the temple are celebrated in the temple. And the temple once again becomes the focus of the socio-cultural uh, that community that is still existing in largely in India's villages. Temples were meant to play a much bigger role in our life than just to uh, fulfill our spiritual needs. So let us talk about, I'm going to, in my talk, I'm going to first talk about what is a Hindu temple what is its significance, how it was built. Then I will talk about how temples were uh, the focus point of social life of the community. Then I will talk about temples as economic centers. Then I will talk about uh, temples as a, a, a spiritual unifier of this great country called Bharata. And I will talk about what we can do in the future to reclaim this space. So, let me take you on a journey along this beautiful institution called a Hindu temple. Let me state right in the beginning that a Hindu temple is not just a building. It is an institution that is supposed to encompass all aspects of both our spiritual life as well as our secular life. Because to be a Hindu, Hindu means there is no artificial between spiritual life and secular life. We are all supposed to be the part of this great universe and therefore the Hindu temple is also supposed to be the physical manifestation of this universe. So Hindu temples be a spiritual around which education, literature, community relationships, commerce, economics, as well as even politics have centered over the centuries, over thousands of years in India. A Hindu temple represents the ideals of Dharma. All our four Purusharthas, Dharma, Artha, Kama and Moksha are celebrated in the temple. And as you go inside the temple, you are supposed to remind yourself of the pursuit of each Purushartha. But ultimately, because our aim in life of every devout Hindu is to attain Moksha, the actual experience of the deity's darshan is supposed to be the experience of uh, the, the pursuit of the fourth Purushartha, that is the moksha. How do we do that? So initially when we enter a temple, you know that most of the ancient and big temples in India, they have a huge praharam. So you enter in South India particularly, you enter through a gopuram door, you enter the temple and you will see this huge temple ahead of you and there is a outside Pradakshina Patha, Parikrama Patha or Pradakshina Temple and you will see many murtis and many stories being depicted on the outside walls of the temple. Now those stories and those murtis can be from the daily life of people, they can be erotic sculptures, they can represent the different epics like Ramayana and Mahabharat or they can that is supposed to be it is a very colorful a very vibrant celebration of art and culture and of our sculptures and people devotees are supposed to go around the temple see those sculptures and even talk about possibly learn about Kama learn about Artha learn about Dharma in this outside Pradakshina and once this Pradakshina is done then you come outside the Mukha Mandapa the temple is usually built on a high pedestal on a high Adishtana and there are many steps that you need to climb as you go inside the temple 
what is the purpose of such a high adhishthana if you visit the khandariya mahadev temple of khajuraho for example or even the bragadeshwara temple of tanjavur you will see that you will have to climb many steps to actually reach the temple platform now why are those steps important those steps are supposed to remind you that you are elevating yourself to a different spiritual plane which is different from your normal uh, secular plane so as you climb each step and go towards the temple you are actually supposed to shed all your human desires and all your human frailties like your ego like your anger like your desire like the pursuit of uh, earthly pleasures and you are supposed to make yourself more introspective as you climb those steps as with each step you are supposed to elevate yourself spiritually and you finally reach the mukha mandapa which is the first layer of going inside the temple so you see the mukha mandapa you see the pillars of the mukha mandapa then you enter the big mandapa which is variously known as ranga mandapa with the pine many parts of the of the country and that is usually a huge community hall which is built along many pillars the purpose of this sabha mandapa is that it's a congregation hall so all the people who are coming to the temple all the devotees they are supposed to get together in the sabha mandapa and at the center of the sabha mandapa there is something known as a rangashila which is like a platform where artists are supposed to offer seva so there are dance performances there are music performances there are bhajan kirtanas there are lectures there are learned people giving discourses on the vedas all sitting on that platform or all performing on that platform and all the devotees who are entering the temple are supposed to sit all around that platform and enjoy these uh, activities that is your community activity that is your cultural activity once you satiate all your senses with this cultural activity once you educate yourself once you listen to good music once to see a beautiful dance performance then you need to take a pause for a while before you get ready for darshan so where and how do you take this pause for that also our stapatis have devised this wonderful little space known as the antarala which literally actually means space so the antarala is this little enclosure that separates the sabha mandapa from the garbhagraha garbhagraha is where the deity is so in that antarala you are supposed to pause a while you are supposed to your senses are now completely satiated with the sensory experiences that you have had outside the temple as well as all the discourses and dance and music that you have seen in the sabha mandapa but now you are supposed to stand there pause a while and make yourself ready to enter the sacred threshold to actually have the darshan of the deity and once you center yourself once you remind yourself that you are in the temple to actually have the darshan and that is your ultimate goal that you are the jivatma and the deity in the garbhagraha is the uh, is the representation of the paramatma or the brahman and when you are standing outside the garbhagraha and you are gazing at the deity that is the darshana that we are talking about you are supposed to be getting ready for the union of the jivatma with the parmatma or the atman with the brahman because of that the garbhagraha however ornate the temple may be on the outside the garbhagraha is almost always a plain square space with no murtis with no decorations except for the deity that is being worshiped in the temple and even today in many temples in south india you will see that these garbhagrahas are not lit by electric lights they are lit only by oil lamps there is a reason for it because the deity in the temple the temple itself is a representation of the body of the vastu purusha according to the vastu purush mandala and the deity enshrined in the temple is the soul is the soul of the temple is the atman of the temple is the atman of the vastu purusha and therefore it is lit by only the light within that is the light of the lamps so as devotees stand outside the threshold of the garbhagraha there is a huge uh, threshold actually that you are supposed to cross and only people technically 
only people sorry i got a call only people who are technically qualified who have made themselves ready to enter the temple who have spiritually elevated themselves to enter the temple can had the right to enter the temple and enter the garbhagriha and take darshan now in many places now it is a uh, very uh, very very uh, place specific there are certain temples in india where nobody is allowed to go into the garbhagriha and touch the deity except the pujari because there are certain notions of ritual purity and there are certain temples where anybody can walk in and have the darshan of the deity that is also accepted but that is the beauty of the hindu temple as an institution because every place every uh, region of india has its own different practices but one thing is common that is the temple is supposed to be the hindu temple is supposed to be the representation of the vastu purusha and that is why the temple is usually built on a grid where the outermost layers are known as the paishachika layers which are dedicated to the ghosts or the evil spirits or the negative energies and as you enter that grid with every possible layer you get closer and closer to the deity so after the paishachika layer the second layer is the manushika layer which is supposed to be meant for mere mortals people like us you know who are not evil but who have who are always pulled in multiple directions due to the desires and due to the pulls and pushes of life once you cross over that threshold you reach the daivik threshold where you elevate yourself getting ready for the experience of the darshan finally at the center of that square is the brahma uh, center where at the center of it is actually the garbhagriha and where the deity is enshrined where as i explained earlier the experience of standing before the deity is meant to be a small reminder of for you to to work towards moksha which is supposed to be your ultimate spiritual goal your atman uniting with the parmatman or the brahma that is what the temple is supposed to tell you so every time you are supposed to go to the temple it is supposed to remind you that in this life pursue the three purusharthas ethically follow dharma follow artha follow kama but ultimately your aim is to attain moksha and that is what the bhagwan ka darshan is supposed to tell you each time you go to the temple now where are the temples built temples are built on very specific locations and there are ancient spiritual texts which go in great detail talking about the location of the temple a temple is known as a teertha which actually means crossing over crossing over where crossing over from the secular to the spiritual crossing over from the profane to the profound that is why a temple is known as a teertha so temp- teertha is usually on the banks of a river or close to a water body or a lake or if there is no water body then you are supposed to first build a temp water tank near the temple which is the temple pushkarini and every temple has a small or a big pushkarini it is supposed to be built either in the center of a town which is surrounded by uh, trees and beautiful gardens or it can be built on a mountain from where you get a beautiful way uh, view of the valley and you can see that in most of the ancient temples that are found in india that the spaces have been very carefully chosen now from teertha we come to kshetra a kshetra because of stories associated with this because of its location because of its legend and in that kshetra there are many teerthas or temples places like kashi places like madurai places like srirangam places like tirupati are all kshetras which have more than one temple associated with it and since time memory in memorial bharatiyas have been visiting these temples for darshan how are the temples built the temples are built following various agamas following various ancient texts and there is a very careful uh, process followed in building of the temple right from the selection of the site to the final putting of the kumbhabishekam or final putting of the kalasha 
on top of the temple and opening the eyes of the the deity to be enshrined and the prana pratishtha which is usually done right in the end there is a whole team of people who have their uh, own spaces in this temple building process starting from one yajmana who decides to build the temple it can be a king it can be a wealthy merchant nowadays it can be a corporate body it can be a community body anybody who decides to build a temple based on that there is a <coughs> there is a there is a guru who is well versed in spiritual matters who is well versed in panchanga who is well versed in astronomy who can guide the yajmana in saying that we'll select this place and this is where you build the temple and then there is a whole team of people starting from astapati who is the architect of the temple to the takshakas who are the actual uh, sculptors who are working on the stones to build the temple it's a long process and that is a process that is being followed in the building of the ram mandir also today exactly as it was specified by the uh, scriptures and even today there are many many uh, stapatis in india in different parts of bharat who are following this traditional occupation and who are building temples exactly as the ancient Suppose geography. Suppose to the three, four halas and the third yes. He is suppose before uh, the stapati builds a building, uh, the temple building. He is supposed to go through. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Please continue. Okay. Before a stapati starts a building. he is supposed to actually undergo ritual penance there are uh, there are certain uh, rituals specified he has to increase his tapas for example people who are uh, building the murtis of jagannath every 12 years jagannath uh, bhagwan jagannath bhagwan balabhadra and subhadra they have to lock themselves in the temple for 21 days and in those 21 days they are supposed to undergo they are not supposed to eat non veg or Obviously, but they are also supposed to do meditation. They are supposed to do dhyana. They are supposed to lead a sattvic lifestyle. Only then can they build this temple, or only then they can carve the murtis. And this has all been specified in multiple, uh, multiple texts uh, going back to thousands of years. So this is how temples are built even today. And you would be surprised to know that even in a state like tamil nadu even in one state there are close to 75000 temples so you can imagine what will be the total number of temples that exist in india today small or big right from your neighborhood shrine to a really big temple like the konark temple or the brigadeeshwara temple and this is despite the 40000 odd temples that were destroyed by the islamic invaders and many of them have been turned into mosques many of them are not in use now many of them are not in living temples but despite that just in one state like tamil nadu there are close to 75000 uh, temples in undivided andhra there were close to 30 more than 30000 temples that is the profusion of temples in india basically india was a sacred land it was a sacred geography that was full of hindu temples so now we come to what is a hindu temple and why do you go there for darshan now we come to what was the purpose of the temple where the temples only the place meant for us to go and uh, satisfy our spiritual needs where the temples only places meant for us to get darshan no the temples were so much more than that temples were social institutions over everything else and by social institutions i mean that every aspect of human life was closely linked with the temple the 16 samskaras that a hindu is supposed to undergo were closely linked with the temples and even today 
many of the temples still have places designated places where these rituals can be made and there are priests at the temple who help you do that right from the naming of the baby to the annaprashana of the baby to the shraddha of the of a deceased person to marriages being fixed to the child's uh, you know before the child is born the simandam that a mother uh, has to undergo all of these rituals are held in different parts of the temple many temples still have a rangamancha where anybody can come and do their arangetram or do a dance performance or offer singing as seva it happens even today temples were places where justice was also dispensed like in goa there's a temple called the mahalsa temple and it was recognized even by the portuguese government that that temple has a sacred place in settling disputes because two parties which had a dispute they would often come to the temple and they would take a oath under the bell of the temple and people believed that if somebody lied or if somebody was unjust the 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 goddess would punish them and that is why that belief made that place more powerful than any secular court in goa or in that day and that this is documented history in many places in india temples acted like courts they also acted like places where people would come together and have discourses on various things they would meet the temples where uh, places where people of all ages and all genders would come to mix with their peers and that is how many problems of the village got sorted out within the temple itself the temple had a big tank the temples had their own granaries so in case of a drought the temple tank would provide water to the entire village the temple granary would provide food to the entire village and the temples were built in such a way that natural uh, rainwater distribution all the rainwater channels in the temple would empty into the temple tank so the temple tank would always have enough water so that in case of a drought in case if a if a village didn't get rainfall for a couple of years the temple tank would still have water now we come to talk about temples as an economic institutions temples were huge centers of economy they were huge centers of commerce temples had huge precincts and these precincts would actually be uh, doubling up as markets so nearby villagers or nearby craftsmen would actually bring their ware and they would be sold in the temple precincts even now if you go to any temple town the roads leading to the temple are full of small small shops right which sell all the puja objects they will sell all the all the local uh, handicrafts they will sell the local weaves everything that you see in that village or in that center or in and around that center you can get it for example if you go to tanjavur and if you see the shops outside the brigadeshwara temple you will get those typical dolls with shaking heads uh, i don't know what you call them in tamil but you get them in those small little stores you get you get chettinadu sarees in the stores you get brass small brass vessels you get murtis you get flowers of course you get vastrams for gods so these are all remnants of temples as a marketplace then the temples themselves had huge lands which would have been given to people to till and the people would keep a certain amount of that uh, produce and they would give the rest of it to the temple the temple was a huge employment generator there are inscriptions in the brigadeshwara temple alone in the 12th century which say that the, that one temple alone employed 600 people and this was excluding the people who offered priestly services to god these were dancers these were musicians these were cooks these were vets who looked after the elephants and the horses that were dedicated to the temple these were carpenters who would look after the the woodwork of the temple and would make sure that the chariot of the temple was up and running it would include uh, the the teachers who were associated with the veda patishalas that were associated with the temple it included artists it included painters it included weavers whose job was to weave exclusive textiles for the god and it included some temples even had hospitals attached to them 
there is there are inscriptions of a temple from andhra pradesh which say that the temple actually had a prasuti sala which means a maternity home where women would come when they were pregnant and they would be ensured a delivery it is uh, our temples were this all encompassing temples also served as banks because they had huge supplies of gold and silver and they uh, gave uh, loans to people who need them at a very nominal interest rate and that is also how temples worked temples also worked as a place of refuge in case there was a war in case there was a earthquake in case there was a natural disaster like a flood all the people from the nearby villages could gather into a temple because the temple would have huge spaces there would be dharmshalas outside the temple where people could come and sleep and they would get fed free of cost at the temple and that is how the temple was it was the nucleus of the entire community's life in all aspects even today if you go to many temples in south india if you go to coastal karnataka for example all the temples there offer free anna chatram where anybody who is hungry can come and eat no matter what your caste is no matter what your religion is no matter what your creed is no matter what your age is you can get free food this was a tradition all across india the tradition of annadan temples were a place where the kings would celebrate their victories temples were also places where the kings would get coronated chidambaram was a coronation temple of the chola kings for multiple generations all their kings would get coronated in the coronation hall in chidambaram that was the temple they designated for this purpose temples were uh, built not just by kings they were built by wealthy merchants they were built by senapatis like the somanathapuram temple near mysore was built by the commander of a hoysala king they were also built by ordinary people like the doddo gatavali temple was built was built by a businessman who was a devotee of the kolapur uh, mahalakshmi and he wanted a temple in his village which was dedicated to the same goddess so the doddo gatavali built temple was built and he gave the money for it sometimes all the ordinary people of the village they contributed they contributed their efforts and they contributed their money and they built a temple many village temples were built like this and even today the temples are village temples are renovated like this with people giving shramadan so that's how the temple was an economic center how was the temple an uh, educational center that is because many temples were sites of veda patashalas which were attached to the temples and even today there are many temples in india which still support vedic education there are many temples in india now who offer colleges and schools uh, that give education in uh, secular studies like your regular degree education there are engineering colleges there are medical colleges there are specialized courses that are started by temples but it is not a new tradition this is what our temples have always have been they have been the centers of education and what is interesting is that everybody who came to study in these temples and everybody who came to teach in the schools associated with these temples they were given free lodging boarding without charging them a single paisa education was completely free and they were supposed to stay at the temple do their duties and take a education that is how temples kept our education alive and this was not just the scriptural education temples had schools dedicated to performing arts like temples taught music temples taught dance temple taught crafts there were schools associated with temples that would teach weaving that would teach metal work everything that the temple needed the temple produced its own institution so that people would be educated in that in that sense temples were great educational institutions now we come to explore temples as a great unifier of the sacred geography called india temples have been in existence in india for thousands of years even when india was not the country as we know it today with one common border one common army and whatever is the definition of a nation state today but india was always a nation that is because our temples kept this nation together and the concept of teertha yatras or pilgrimages was devised precisely for this there were temples all over india and there were specific pilgrimages that were devised 
for ordinary Hindus to travel across India. And this is how the country was kept united. This is how, despite our diversity, despite our linguistic diversity, despite our dietary diversity, despite our diversity in climate, despite our diversity in clothing, India was culturally one. The civilizational and cultural ethos of this country was united because of temples in different parts of India. Even today, every devout Hindu thinks of doing the Chardham Yatra once in their lifetime. Where are the Chardhams? Dwarka, Padrinath, Puri and Kashi. These and Rameshwaram. These are uh, the places which are from uh, different parts of India and there are certain specific uh, protocols that you need to follow that you need to go to Kashi you need to get the Ganga ka Pani from Kashi and then you need to go to Rameshwaram, which is right at the southern tip of India and you're supposed to do the Abhishek of the Rameshwaram Lingam with the water that you got from Kashi. Why was this legend followed? Why was this custom devised? That is because it was supposed to unite the north and the south in one single thread of devotion. There are 51 Shakti Pitas. Now two of them happen to be in Pakistan, which people were supposed to visit in their lifetime. The 51 Shakti Pitas are distributed all over India from the east to the west, from the south to the north. There are 108 Sri Vishnu Divyadesans, which people uh, think that the 100 in, uh, there are 106 that you can visit in this lifetime. The other two are after you pass on, after they are, they are in Vaikuntam. But these 106 uh, Divyadesans are spread all over the country, not just in South India. There are Divyadesans in Uttar Pradesh. There are Divyadesans in, uh, in Uttarakhand. There is a Divyadesan in Nepal as well. That is, again, a cultural unified map of India, which the people were supposed to explore. They were supposed to learn from each other. And when they traveled from place to place, and remember, travel was not as easy as it is today. Today, if you want to go to Kashi, you can simply go to make my trip, book a ticket to Kashi and go to Kashi. and You can come back in two days. In olden days, going to Kashi was a journey of a lifetime. So many people scheduled it at the end of their lifetime. And then when they went to Kashi, they never decided to come back because to die in Kashi was to attain Mukti. And when they came back from Kashi, the journey was so arduous that they were supposed to give a, 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 a full a samaradhane, a full meal to all the villagers because it was very difficult for you to go to Kashi and come back safely. So as a Thanksgiving measure, you're supposed to give a samaradhane. Accordingly, the four Kumbha Melas, People have been participating in the four Kumbha Melas in four different corners of India since times immemorial. Huan Sang, who visited India in the 8th century CE during Harshavardhana's time, he talks about the king taking a bath at the Sangamit Prayag during the Kumbha Mela and people coming from all over the country for a ritual bath at the Sangam. Who told them? Who sent them WhatsApp messages? Who called them and said, come to Prayag on this, this date at this, this time to take bath in the Sangam? People knew. How did they know? That is the power of faith. That is the power of temples. That is the power of Hindu Dharma. That is what kept us united. Even today, when we talk about traveling, you would be surprised to know that travel in India is booming because of religious pilgrimage travel. There is data which says that in one year since the Kashi Vishnath corridor has happened, the footfall to Kashi has increased from 80 lakh people per year to 7 crore people per year. And this is happening to almost all the pilgrimage places because now people have money and they want to go not to the beaches, not to the fun places. They also want to do that. But before anything else, they want to visit a place of pilgrimage. and. It is not a tradition of today. Places like Gaya, places like Kashi, places like Badrinath were famous places of pilgrimage even from the times of the Buddha and the Mahavir Jain because both Buddha and Mahavir, they actually came to Kashi. They traveled all over the country because they knew it was an important place of worship. 
In fact, all the saints of India have actually done pilgrimages right from Sri Adi Shankar Acharya who did two digvijayas all over India. Everybody traveled. Everybody went from temple to temple. Guru Nanak Ji went from temple to temple. Uh, Sriman Shankar Deva Assam went from temple to temple. The, the Alvar uh, saint poets from Tamil Nadu went all the way to Chitrakoot. They went all the way to Badrinath to sing hymns to Sri Vishnu. And that is why these places are known as the Divedesams today. There were 12 Jyotirlingas, Dwadasha Jyotirlingas, which you're supposed to visit. Again, in 12 different places in India, encompassing the entire sacred geography of India, which people were supposed to visit. Pilgrimage or Tirtha Yatra is such a sacred tradition in India that even during the Mahabharat, Balaram, who did not want to participate in the war because he did not want to know which side he would fight, he actually uh, did not participate in the war, but he went on a pilgrimage to the uh, to the Prabhas Tirtha and there is a long mention of his pilgrimage and all the temples that he visited, all the places of that he were visited in Mahabharat. That has been the tradition of our country. That is how uh, temples, Hindu temples have kept this country together long before we came to be known as a nation state as it is defined today. We were always a nation. Because even in scriptures in Odisha, uh, that date back to, I, I forget the year, but the king says that he is going on a pilgrimage across Bharata Vassa. So they knew of this cultural entity called Bharat. It may have been composed of small kingdoms with individual kings, but Bharat was always one and the boundaries of Bharat were depicted by Hindu temples in different parts of the country and people were visiting those temples since times memorial even when traveling was so difficult. That is our tradition. That is the importance of temples in India. Now we come to what is the situation today. Today we know that after the Places of Endowment and Worship Act was passed in 1951, many temples, most temples actually, most Hindu temples only, okay, no other place of worship, were taken over by the government, which means that the government has complete control over the temple's land. It has the complete control over temple's funds. It has complete control over the temple's management. And the community, the Hindu people for whom these temples should be, they have zero control over the management of the temples. So what happens is that devout Hindus, they put money in the hundi, they donate to the temples and they donate in thousands of rupees every year because the sheer footfall to Hindu temples is so huge. And the government gets access to ready-made funds, which the government can decide to uh, do whatever, which is why temple lands are always given away for secular purposes. The government needs a building, encroach temple land. Christians need a symmetry, encroach on temple land. That is what happened in Tirnelveli. Thankfully, it was stopped by a court judgment. This also means that because temples are controlled by the government, the courts have a legal right to interfere in Hindu temples. So the courts get to decide who gets to visit a temple. The courts get to decide how much water you need to offer as a Abhisheka. And this actually happened in Ujjain. The court mandated that you can only offer half a liter of uh, mineral water as a bishake to the temple. The courts can decide finally how many liters of oil that a temple can use to light the lamps. There is undue judicial interference only in the management of Hindu temples. That is because Hindus have ceded control and our temples have ceased to be institutions that were the focus of our community life. We have now reduced temples to only experiences that are meant for our spiritual upliftment so that we just go to the temple, quickly have a darshan and come back. It is time for us to reclaim our temples because the day we reclaim our temples, the day we get access to the funds of these temples, there can be tremendous work that can be done for Hindu society, which can be spearheaded by temples once again. And temples can once again rightfully be the focus of community life of this country. Temples are what held this country together. And temples will be the one institution which will be a pivot 
around which Hindu communities' progress will be held in the future if we decide and if we stand firm as Hindus and if we reclaim temples and if we make temples once again a part of our community activity. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was indeed a very thought-provoking lecture. Uh, lots of aspects that you touched upon will surely make us think and hopefully some of us will act on it. Uh, so one question, you know, you ended by saying Hindus have to take back control of temples. So yeah. one thing that we always hear is, okay, we are ready to give you them the control of temples, but who is the one who is going to actually control? Because the community itself is divided on so many lines. Uh, so how do you think the Hindu community should get ready to take back control of temples? See, that is a very false logic, you know. Do you ask other people of other religions? They also have their own divisions. Do you ask them who is going to manage your places of worship? Christianity has churches which are segregated along caste lines. Does anyone ask them who manages your church? You just assume that they have a right to manage their own churches, right? They assume, you assume that, uh, that, that uh, Muslims have a right to manage their masjids. So why not give the same right to Hindus? Hindus will decide for themselves. It's not the government's job to decide who's going to control the temples. The community is quite capable. The community has enough people who wish well for the temple and who are willing to work for the temples. They work for the temples even now when they don't get anything in return. They still give a lot of money to temples now, even though they know that money is going to the temples and probably used to, you know, line the pockets of some babu or to be used as a bribe to some politician somewhere. So it's completely false logic and it is usually done by people who do not want to cede control of Hindu temples. They are the only people who are asking. I come, from, I come from a state called Goa where the temples are community controlled. Okay, I have seen this model work. And I know for a fact that the temples in Goa are better kept, they are cleaner, they are more open, they have more control over how they spend their funds on. And they not only beautify the temple, but they also do a lot of educational activities. They do a lot of intellectual activities. They do a lot of uh, social activities because they have complete control over their funds. And Goan temples are one of the best kept, cleanest, most welcoming temples anywhere in the world, anywhere in India. And that's a fact. Absolutely. We are, we are so, you know, surrounded by these narratives that often we fall prey to what other people around us are telling about ourselves without actually introspecting. Now, there are a couple of other questions that we got. Uh, you know, when, there, when we talk about temples, we often talk about the big temples of Sri Rangam or uh, the Tirupati or Kashi or things where mm -hmm. there are kshetras. But there are yeah. very small village level temples or Gramadevata temples, which have yes. its own cultural and, you know, societal significance. But how yes. is there the ways to uplift these temples? Because when we travel, we see that they're almost all the time in shambles, except for a few places. How See, can... the community, only the community can take charge of these temples, right? The temples belong to the Hindu community. And it is the community around the temple that has to take charge. And that, that is where there are Hindu organizations that can play a big role in motivating the people of that community. See, a central organization can never protect a small temple in small village. You wouldn't even know that temple exists. That temple has to be protected by the people of that community. And that can only happen when the young people of that community have a stake in the running of the temple. They have to feel that this temple belongs to them. I know for a fact that there are temples in Tamil Nadu where I went and it was it was so tragic. These are royal temples built by the Cholas, okay, like a thousand years ago. And the Pujari was telling me that there is no money in the temple even to light a lamp because the temple falls under the 
the the government department and because it's a small temple in a small village nobody really goes there except on special days and the village uh, people have actually moved out to the city so there are very few people living in that village so there is nobody coming to the temple on a regular basis on festival days they come but on regular days they don't so the temple doesn't even have money to light the daily lamp how tragic is that and i think that is our responsibility at hindus you know not everything the government can do what stops us even if the temple is under government control if it is in your village if it is in your neighborhood what stops any of us from offering at least a few hours every week to the seva of the temple go and sweep the premises or go and ask if you can do anything you can teach children take a class whatever may be your skill in your neighborhood temple if nothing else document the temple talk about the temple's architecture make a small video video put it on instagram talk to the elders find out who built the temple what is the local legend associated with the temple who is the deity enshrined in the temple what is the local name of the deity what is the local festival there are so many things that can be documented but the thing is we do not think of it as important our young think that places to hang out are malls places to hang out are pubs places to hang out are movies the temple is a big open space in the center of the community why can't the young people go there and simply play once a week, once a week or they practice during ganesh chaturthi or they practice their annual gathering or whatever it is why is not the temple a part of our community activities as it used to be once mm. yes so the onus is rightly on us uh, as um, as devout hindus to actually uplift our own uh, sacred spaces i'll 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 tell you an example in gujarat there is a place i forgot the name of the place there are some very old temples there which have been completely destroyed by the muslims that is you know the, not one temple is in the in a pristine condition and they are not living temples they are under the state archaeology department but there is no deity there as such because the deity has been destroyed the temple has also been destroyed the murtis have been destroyed and yet there is one guy in the village nearby just one guy but he goes there every evening does a puja of the empty garbhagriha lights a lamp there and comes and he does that every single day come rain or shine he doesn't have to do it nobody pays him a salary for that he goes there because he thinks it is his duty as a hindu to keep that light on in the temple to keep the light of dharma on in that temple where there is no garbhagriha because once his ancestors must have worshiped there that is the link how many of us think like that absolutely it is these men these people who actually are keeping our dharma who are they? Who, yeah but who who are these people why can't we be these people yes absolutely yeah but why can't we why can't why can't you be these people why can't i be these people so how long are we going to say there are these people who save our dharma for us mm-hmm. we are these people i am these people you are these people everybody listening to this is these people mm. absolutely so one other thing that we got a question when you were talking about this is there is always a link to what we study and what we act so the, there was a, there's an a very interesting question which says it needs a different kind of sensitivity for managing and uplifting the temples and india being the land of temples is it feasible or is it doable to have an academic course related to temples there is, are uh... Uh, there there are there are different courses run by different uh, universities actually and increasingly i see young people getting more interested in knowing more about temples so there are some universities there is one university in pune which is offering a two years masters course specifically for architects in ancient indian architecture and a temples hindu temples architecture is a big part of it there are courses which talk about temple management there are courses which talk about uh, temple as a repository of art and literature there are courses but uh, it's just that they're not very well known and uh, they're not very easily uh, easily how would you say applicable to common citizens that needs to happen more and more so um, you know 
we have touched you've touched upon so many aspects of temples uh, you know as a cultural center as a social center as an economic center as a spiritual center so it really encompasses all of hindu life so how it does yeah so what is that thing that young you know a lot of disha bharat uh, stakeholders are young students so when a student or a young individual visits the temple with what if you have to give them in a nutshell you know what would be your message to all of them you know your entire talk was the message but if they want to listen to it in an instagram snippet how would you tell them that it's this is the message for you to take home i would like to give the young people a challenge that do instagram videos of temples in your vicinity you don't have to go far do one video once 15 days once a month even take 12 temples in your city or in your locality they can be small temples they can be big temples they can be temples in your neighborhood find out the history of the temple meet the pujari talk to him ask him who built the temple why was this temple built here was this temple in the same shape Uh, for many years or has it been renovated if renovated are there any old pictures that you can access and you can document it that's important documentation and it's only when you document your cultural uh, heritage that you know that you have such an important uh, important dharohar which you need to protect and preserve that's the least you can do and once you start doing it you will get yourself so immersed in the temple and the stories of it that you will want to get involved more and more absolutely i think it time has come where we start uh, loving our temples living with them and growing with them and seeing that we grow uh, you know when like you said when we enter the temple we go to the adhyatma from the adibhuta so that journey will help not just us but a society the society as a whole i think that's a wonderful message to give to all our young listeners today thank you very much for gracing our platform uh, and sparing your measurable time invaluable time with us uh, so uh thank thanks once again uh, shefali ji for coming here it was a pleasure listening to you indeed it was absolutely my pleasure and it is a topic that i feel very passionate about next time you should call me to talk about textiles that's Definitely. another of my passions yes certainly we'll keep that in mind uh, thank you so much thank you uh, moving on before we close a quick look at what is coming up next uh, in our uh, series of this my bharat series so tomorrow morning we have students from across bharat talking about sister nivedita bhagini nivedita is what is, is the topic for tomorrow and there are many more topics uh, on which our students are going to be talking please do uh, see that program 7 am sharp we are going to go live on disha bharat facebook page that is the morning students program and then the next one is tomorrow's talk is an other interesting topic indian strategic leadership in the changing world order uh, by ms soumya chaturvedi author and international relations scholar in london uk so uh, this this is a topic which is uh, which is much spoken about today and we'll get more in depth insights from uh, ms samya chaturvedi tomorrow same time 7 pm 10th august tomorrow thursday uh, i hope to see you all in large numbers again so then we also have a state level essay competition bharat in amritkal the role of youth uh, shefali ma'am has given us one task to uh, you know to add to this uh, what could be the role of youth i hope you have that and much more ideas and put that all in words so that we can see what what is our young students visioning bharat in amritkal that is our essay competition and of course we have our swarajya ratha which is traveling across the length and breadth of karnataka today it is in kalburgi bidar and the, uh, uh, you know up north of karnataka it is going to all the small schools villages uh, uh, and reaching to far wider audience tomorrow it will be from bidar to yadgiri so if if any of you are around there definitely do visit our ratha and say bharat mata ki jai in front of the bharat mata picture there looking forward to seeing you with the ratha 
Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good Thank evening. Thank you.